Bruva stood by the bridge like a statue, arms crossed, eyes squinting. Meave sighed inside. She stood little chance of having a pleasant chat. Elder in chief, sir. No Sharon and Grayson here, lass. Plowed humans. Always out to fix things, always end up cocking them up. You think you're due glory, do you? Monster slayer Meave, patroness of dwarves, blast it. What do you think? Why didn't I exterminate those beasts myself, eh? Go on, tell me. For you. For I didn't want to. For something didn't fit, damn it. So I resolved to not destroy their nests and evidence till I learned the truth of who done it. Postponed it all those years expressly. Though your subjects were dying. I didn't need no lectures from the likes of you. Justice must be served. That's worth any price. And I was close. Had leads. And now it's all gone to hell. You flooded Devore's abyss. You brought Poro's rump down on itself. And I'll never ken who killed the Fuchses. Understand? Never! I would not be so sure. Sure of bloody what? That you shall never learn the truth. For I learnt it just moments ago. Twas the Zigrins who killed the Fuchses. The si Zigrins? But... Oh, no. Aye, it'd explain a lot, that. Ah, the snakes! Worms! Rogues! Why, I'll show them! All right. Could you admit you've more in that pretty heat of yours than I expected? But dinner you start thinking we'll be toasting a new friendship. You want our aid? You'll have to answer our questions. My questions! Lots of them! And they're all hard, so dinner you go smiling at me yet. Why, I wouldn't dare. Better not! Right. Time we moved on. Bruva set off at a brisk pace, paying Meave nor anyone else heed. The Elder's bodyguards rushed after him, then came the Lyrian force, and at its end trudged Gabor Zigrin, hands and feet in shackles. Dwarves demonstrate innovative thinking in many domains. Metallurgy, engineering, architecture. Yet there is one in which they could not be bothered. Naming. For this reason, the bridge that linked the Mahakam Pass with Mount Carbon was simply named Langbridge. Neve learned it was a thoroughly fitting name. Having stopped for a breath halfway across the road suspended over a deep chasm, the Queen could see neither end of the bridge, both concealed by thick clouds. Amazing, whispered the Queen. I feel as though we traversed the very sky. The Queen and her retinue were nearing Mount Carbon when Meave heard a cry. It was Xavier. Hold! Hold! Meave drew in her reins abruptly. Her mare neighed and reared, lifting the Queen above her formation of men. From that height, she saw the last pier of the bridge crumbling. The dwarves at the head of the procession were unable to stop in time and plummeted, screaming into the abyss. What's the meaning of this, God damn it? Bruva roared. Face the engineers! No! The queen was striving to calm her spooked mount when she sent something swish past her ear. Out of nowhere, a Scoia'tael band had appeared at the rear of the column. Before anyone could react, elven archers had felled the rear guard. The soldiers lay on the bridge's stone surface with arrows in their backs. Esma'en Reina! Meave was trapped. In one direction lay the chasm, in the other, a fierce foe. She had no choice but to stand and fight.
Darth Renner, you are mine. We're trapped, Your Grace, but we can try and fight our way through. Yorvi! Yeah. Again and again and again. Should I listen to me, old lady? I scars? No, they don't hurt. Gonna need um, three buckets of nails and a tub full of pegs. Yeah, yeah. And just when you thought things were about to get dull. Got business for me? Arm is a waste of time for one like me. Nay, do one became chemist. Yeah. This harvest will be reaping black clad heads. Special price, just for you, love. Watch your heads! <laughs> Catch! Don't you worry yourself, you crazy. Look at how you're in no time. Swords I smile at, weapons laugh to scorn. Not think you poor bags can do whatever the devils you please? This is Mahakam! Sort it all. No! Blood Arena! She must die! Their strength combined, the Lyrians and Dwarves managed to defeat the Scoia'tael. The Gorillas had weakened the last span of the bridge, turning the crossing into a deadly trap. Had Xavier, who noticed the weakened structure at the last instant, not called out, all would have fallen into the chasm. The Lyrians managed to capture the unit commander. She stood, her head raised high, and when Meave glared at her, she did not avert her eyes. What is your name, Elf? Abayat me parst one. She said, uh... Thank you, Reynard. I know well what she said. Kiss my ass. Is that truly the best you can muster? I'd rather show you exactly what I can muster. Tell them to unbind me. You got your opportunity. On the battlefield. Will you not tell me what they call you? Fine. It's all the same to me. I'm more interested to know how you came to be here. Who sent you? No one. It was my decision to kill you. And thus avenge Eldane. You've elven blood on your hands. The blood of the elves of the Mulderwood. I regret the events of the Mulderwood. I did not wish those elves' deaths. Yet they left me no choice. What choice would you give a murderer who invaded your home? <sighs> you know I envy you. To see the world solely as black or white, it must simplify things so. Enough. I've heard all I wish to hear. But I have not Did you fall in your heed, Elf, eh? If you want to fight humans, go on and do it. You cannot talk sense to Egypts and nay here, damn it. Mahakam is and will be neutral. You cannot be neutral. To Dwan, you are either their foe or their dog. Mahakam has stood aside sleeping long enough. That is why we struck it in its very heart, as a call to battle. A call to brethren whom you, Elder, have kept from the world too long. I have kept him away. I've been bloody right to do so. You want to play at war, you numpties? You want to force the Pontar to flow upstream? Gang right ahead. Good riddance, I say. Gun kill, gun die if you fancy. But God damn it, leave us alone. Yeah, I should kill you. With my own hands. 
I should cut your throat, put you out of your misery. That's what you want, isn't it? To die? To die a stupid death? Well, I'll not grant you that. No, no, I'll lock you in a tower. Sit there three centuries, and you just might grow a brain. Bruva Hoog gazed after the shackled elf as she was led away. Neve expected him to continue fuming, cursing her. But the dwarf stood silent, and his old eyes, half concealed by brows bushy as a forest floor, showed not anger, but the deepest sadness. Dwarven engineers made quick work of repairing the crumbled bridge span. Look, Mount Carbon. Damn, and I thought Novograd was big. The Lyrians stepped inside Mount Carbon's bowels. Neve rode while looking upwards, admiring the intricately carved ceiling, gilded walls, monumental bas reliefs carved from basalt. Yet this was no time to admire the sights. Ruva Hoog had summoned her to speak. I thank you for your invitation, Elder. My invitation? Choice term, lass. You wangled your way in here. Long I've lived, but ne'er have I seen a wench so stubborn. With all due respect, do you not feel like a pot conversing with a kettle? Ha! <laughs> True enough. Changes of mind didn't come easy to me. But they do come at times. Human wars concern me not at all. For so many they are, who could count them? Nay a year goes by without one wanking king invading another's realm. A dog with scabies is less restless. That's why this morning I aim to send you off with nothing. Matter not what the clans were saying. Rivia, Shmivia, who gives a sheep's fart? But that was this morn. Before that daft wench and her pups attacked, Nilfgaard supports the Scoyatel, it's common knowledge. Nilfgaard uses them. Well, I'm nay worse, and I choose to use Queen Meave. So what use would you make of me, if I might ask? You've a plan? Aye, the kind dwarves like best. Simple. But sneaky. Like to give Nilfgaard a warning, you can. If you're going to rile my dwarves, draw them into the Scoyatel ranks. You'll regret it, eh? But I'd like to issue the warning without declaring war. All clear to you so far. So, when you march out of Mahakam, you'll find a company of our foot dwarves waiting out with the gate. Officially, volunteers enlisting with you against my will. And you have to put them at the fore next time you face Nilfgaard. Want the black lads to break their teeth on our bucklers, get a taste of our axe blades. After that, dare say they'll think twice before they send more Scoyadel into these hells. I do not. Thank you, Elder. You restore my hope that I shall have my home back in the end. Faith can move mountains, aye, but it cannot do much about borders. I've watched you close, and must admit you're a plucky lass. That enough for Nilfgaard? Can I be sure? We will see. We shall know soon. I would like to march at once. So by your leave? No, <laughs> not granted. At once? What's that mean? Our laws are clear. Guests are to be sent off with a thundering feast, even the humans. Bruva, as was Bruva's wont, insisted. So the Queen accepted the invitation, but as was her wont, set a condition. The feast was to last but one night, and not, as was the wont of local custom, an entire week. All clans were to be represented at the feast, save one, of course, the Zigrins. 
for they had already learned their punishment. The entire clan was banished from Mahakam. An exception was made for one of their number, for Gabor, who was beheaded before the day was done. When the sun had retired behind the peaks, the underground city came alive with the sound of bugles, bagpipes and horns. The dwarves emerged out into the central square and danced exuberantly, sparks kicking up from their hobnail boots. The usually crabby elder-in-chief Hoog proved a cordial host that evening. Let's drink! Lest our neck shafts grow cobwebs! Suddenly a messenger arrived. Bruver lifted his copper horn to his ear and listened with furrowed brow. What's that? Speak up! When she saw a sour grin on his face, Meave knew the tidings were not good. Yet she did not suspect they pertained to her directly. Meave, you expecting anyone? How's that? Runner says a delegation's arrived at Carbon. Freluria and Rivia got a Nilfgaardian escort. How dare they? Traitors. Who leads it? Uh, you'd best sit. Who leads the delegation? It's your son. Willem, I fear. Willem? Markham remains neutral as regards all your squabbles. I trust I needn't remind you. So I'll have no scrambling or shoving, and certainly no bloodshed. Point of fact, I'd prefer it if you... I wish to speak to him. I'd forbid you, but, as I said, never seen a more stubborn wench. All righty then, jabber away with him. Just remember, hands to yourself. Meave spotted banners, a Lyrian eagle upon one surrounded by Nilfgaard's black rags. Her hands became fists, showing how helpless she felt. Then her son and rival, Willem, emerged from behind a row of Imperial footmen. My, my. I should apologize. It seems I missed the coronation. Congratulations, my son. Who was it who placed the crown? General Epdahi? Count Caldwell. Ah, yes. Our elder statesman. Why have you come here, of all places? To acquire arms for Nilfgaard? As my official mission, yes. Yet unofficially, I wish to speak with you. I trust you've had tidings from the field. Edern turned to ash and dust. Vizimir murdered Redania in chaos. Faltus forced to strike a pact by his vassals betrayed. Hensult the same. This limerick, will it come to a point? Why, yes. To the same as this war. Mother, I beg you, you must see it. N Nilfgaard's victory is inevitable. Surrender now, and I shall show you mercy. For later... Later, it'll be too late. There will be no later. We shall repel them, drive them south at the points of our pikes. This we, Mother, who precisely do you mean? You stand alone. An impression many might have indeed. Yet I've allies. Those long loyal and those new. Where, Mother? In Zerikania? For here, in the north, why? There are none. The fight is done. Your friends from Nilfgaard will learn that is simply not true. When their ignorance bites them in the arse. So you aim to persist? Whatever for? For our freedom. For independence. Curious. I could have sworn it was for your ambition to soothe your wounded pride. When I was crowned, a fact you deride, though that makes it no less true, I swore the good of my subjects would guide me. And a war we are doomed to lose cannot in any way benefit them. And slavery can. You know well the Blacklads put peasants in chains, like cattle. Reprehensible, I agree, but... And resettlement? Forced labor? Cruel laws that make death the punishment for the slightest offenses? Are those benefits? Well, answer me! I see I will not swear you, Mother. A shame, though I take comfort in the fact I tried. And now, but you. Oh, no. I, not you, will decide when this conversation is over. Oh, have we anything else to discuss? Are you perhaps aware that the Nilfgaardians tried to kill me? What? No, I... I, I heard only about an avalanche which tumbled down through no small effort of an Imperial envoy. Never would I have agreed to such a heinous act. I believe you. I'm heartened that, despite all we... I believe you, because I believe the North Guardians wouldn't ever have asked your opinion. Think on it, son. Are you their ally or their tool? 
Can you ever be sure? I am the king of Lyria and Rivia. To serve my subjects' best interests, I am prepared to make even the most painful concessions. Might I leave now? Or is there more? Naturally. How did you know you would find me here? I... I received Nilfgaardian reports to the effect that you've been seen in the past. Oh, roses are red and so are your cheeks, my son. As ever when you're caught in a lie. Lyria is two weeks' travel hence. Had you received word only once I was here, we'd have been long gone from Mahakam by the time you assembled a force and completed the march. No. You were forewarned of our intended route. It means I've a traitor in my ranks. Another one. Get out of my sight, Dylan. And pray we only ever face one another on neutral ground. Meave struggled inside not to turn and gaze once more at her son. He'd changed since they'd last faced each other, grown manlier, and he wore the crown well. The Queen returned to the banquet hall. Her advisers shot her questioning glances, curious what she had discussed with Bruva. But Meave decided to keep the details to herself. One of them wore a Nilfgaardian lead around his neck. Until she knew who, she would have to remain vigilant. Feasting's done, Reynard. We must consider our next move. I've thought on it, Your Grace. We've strength enough to hit the foe, but still not the numbers to face him in open battle. So what do you propose? This war we cannot win alone, nor even with the dwarves at our side. But if we secure a victory, small yet symbolic, we shall show the other realms of the North all is not yet lost. Thus, I propose we attack behind the front lines somewhere well clear of any major Imperial force. Where would you suggest? I'm considering Angren. To begin with, a thickly wooded marshy land, always helpful in clandestine operations. Secondly, the land strategically important, as it's the chief source of building material for Nilfgaard's fleets. All too little, I fear. Since we require a victory that would be symbolic, we must strike where it shall hurt, and Angren... Just recently welcomed a new regent, in the person of Count Coldwell, my third argument. Naturally, if your majesty wishes, I'm prepared to present alternatives to this. No need. We march at dawn. Meave had toiled, cajoled, persuaded, and gained the dwarves' support. She left Mahakam strengthened, markedly. Even so, the queen was in a foul mood. For it was clear a traitor a viper nested among the Lyrians, someone who had conveyed the Queen's plans to her foe. From this moment on, Meave would need to weigh every word she uttered, even in the presence of her closest associates. Your Grace, we must plot our course forward. Shall we take the Western Passage into Angren, or...? Not now. When, then? Dawn approaches, yet we know nothing of where... I will not repeat myself. The Queen knew she would learn the traitor's identity in the end. If need be, she would tear the name from the throat of another turncoat, Count Caldwell. Meave drooled at the prospect of seeing Caldwell in chains, then passing him to the hangman. Saddle the horses. I shall take the fall. The time for diplomacy, for preparations and negotiations had gone. Meave was to attack her foe at last, and she could not wait to do so. At long last, Meave's force reached Angren's marshy woods. Ever been? No. Count yourselves lucky. Are you certain we haven't lost our way? Alas, here there is no way. We continue south, that's all. South meaning the bottom. Should you ever venture there, I offer you this advice. Do your utmost to make no noise. Poor soul. His comrades cried out, reached out. But alas, amidst frothing waters, they heard bones cracking, the moan of metal bent and crushed. What the bloody hell, what was that? Rather not know, personally. Hold your positions! Arms at the ready! It was a glusty war. One of many the Lyrians would encounter along their path. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. 
At last, Meave and her force stood upon the Yaruga's bank. To find and punish the traitor Caldwell, they would have to cross the river. Yet the sole bridge nearby was in Nilfgaard's hands. Your Majesty, some new reports require your attention. Hidden among brambles, Meave watched the Nilfgaardian sentries atop the palisade. In full gear, alert in stance, they looked sharp and ready to defend the stronghold. Blast! Meave hissed, for she now knew Red Lobindon would not fall by surprise. A siege would be needed, and it would slow her advance. Yet there was naught she could do, as this was her one road to Angren and to Caldwell. Reynard wiped the sweat from his brow, donned his helmet, and dropped his visor with a tap. On your command, your majesty. Very well. We mustn't delay. Reynard, our plan of attack. Armored infantry to lead and take the first salvo upon their breast, scaling ladders to follow. Afterwards... Masterful. Truly masterful. Interrupted Gascon. Yet, despite the mastery, fit to be improved. How namely? Hold back your force. Lie in waiting. I'll take ten good men and open the gates for you. Wide. And how do you aim to achieve this? Asked Reynard. Knock and claim to be a trinket peddler, I suppose. Or perhaps one of Lebioda's devout disciples. Must you know every last detail? Where's the fun in that, sir? There's none in warfare. Never. Seethed Reynard. For war is no farce. Your Majesty, he stands no chance. Not the slightest. None at all, I concur. Yet his eagerness intrigues. Let's see what he can do. Reynard did not approve of Meave's decision, this was clear. Yet he dared not undermine it. The Queen's blessing now his, Gascon assembled a small force and set off straight for the stronghold gate. Lambs to the slaughter, muttered Reynard, shaking his head. My Queen, it's not too late. We can always... Shh! Look! Already at the gate, Gascon lifted his arm in a gesture of peace, then merrily bantered a bit with the guards. A moment later, the gates jerked into motion. But how? No matter. The gate stands open. We must attack. Meave raced off towards the fortress without even glancing back. She knew well her soldiers would follow. Army's a waste of time for one like me. Ah! There's a time to reap, a time to sow. Left, right, left, right. One man's battlefield is another man's ripe patch for harvest. I'm a boss. 
of my pits. I've got sand up here too. Rabbit the white of an eye from half a league away. Your humble servant. Fear not. We shall achieve our goal. You sweat like a swine in that jacket. It's gonna be a right good levy, big and beautiful. Race me to the great sun! Don't buy this. Notice! All roads lead to Nilfgaard! One red lobbington for you, my lady. Compliments to the house. Gascon seemed a fiend as he fought his way to the keep, then single-handedly killed the commander. Suddenly leaderless, the Nilfgaardians laid down their arms. My, my, Gascon. Color me surprised. Pleasantly so, I trust. Don't fish for compliments, it doesn't suit you. Besides, you know you deserve both medal and title. Ha ha ha! I shall hold you to it, my queen. In due course. But I must know how. What ruse persuaded the North Guardians to open the gate? Come, come. My delightful charms, no ruse. Oh, I see. Not one to share secrets. Unremarkable, as I see it. I'd hold my tongue too, were my conscience thus burdened. I've done now to hide my shameful past, friend. I was a brigand, indeed, yet. Do not dare take me for a fool. You know of what I speak. Yet I don't. Reynard, what is this? What the devil's is with you? Your Grace, in Mahakam, the Nilfgaardian letter we managed to intercept. Consider your offer accepted. Direct Meave and her force to the agreed site. We await their arrival. Your reward shall be as agreed. It was Gascon who told us Caldwell had received Angren to rule. It was Gascon who suggested we ride for Lobindon. Here, the Blackclads willingly opened the gate, for they expected him to deliver a prisoner. You! I don't... I don't believe this. No, it, it cannot be. Deny it, Gascon. Go on. Tell me I'm wrong. Do you require any more proof, Your Grace? What do they promise you? Amnesty? Coin in heaps? Ah... Uh, both. I knew Nilfgaard wouldn't parley with me as a matter of course. To be treated seriously, I needed something they valued. A stroke of luck, it was, the chance to free you from Coldwell's grip. It was in Edern that we first spoke. Then came to an understanding after Rosberg's fall. Why do I still live then? Why not snatch me under Knight's mantle, drag me to Red Lobindon in chains? Leave. I sought to sell you out, I did and aim to gain by it. Yet in Edern, you earned my respect. In Mahakam, my admiration, I swore then I wouldn't follow the terms of the accord I'd made. Instead, I'd let you into the fort and make damn sure the Commandant couldn't reveal the truth. Alas, seems I underestimated Reynard. Flattery will get you nout. You, sir, are a traitor. Oh, please, friend. You appear to me a pot that calls the kettle black. Reynard? What does he mean? I've no notion, Your Grace. Not the slightest. Truly? <laughs> and I had you pegged for a man of honor. Come now, Reynard. Who sent secret missives to Willem? Go on, you really should tell your queen. What? Reynard? His Highness guest chambers in Mahakam. One of my lads snuck in. Found a letter bearing the signature of one Reynard Odo. Reynard, I beg you. 
Say it's not so. Tell me it's a filthy lie. Uh, I, uh, Your Grace. I'd hoped His Highness and you would reconcile. To see son stand against mother rent my heart. I, 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 I wish to help. Behind my back. Your Majesty, I sought merely to push the youth to see reason, to open his eyes. So say you now. Yet I can't know what was in the letters. I can't know what pacts you made. And alas, I can no longer take you at your word. I'm not alone in having deceived. Yet I am in repairing my wrong. Me felt a tempest rise inside her. Yet she could not release it lest it cloud her view. She would solve the problem, strike it from her mind, and resume her journey at once. Drawn and quartered I should have you both. Yet in truth, I cannot do without your aid. Now more than ever, tis the one reason I show mercy and forgive. Your Grace, perhaps made with doubt, but tis the right decision. I shall prove it. Thank you. Reynard and I rarely see eye to eye, but under the circumstances, I second his every word. Oh, shut your damn traps! And I believe you're needed in the wagon train. Now! The Queen's wish was clear and fierce. Gascon and Reynard slid off, leaving Meave to her thoughts. From the Palisades rampart, Meave gazed out over the marshlands across the Aruga. The Queen sighed deeply. She expected great challenges in Angren. She had also expected, even hoped, to find the one traitor in her midst. But two, and both her close aides-de-camp. She felt a weight upon her heart now. Blasted all, she muttered. Not the first dagger I've taken in the back. Likely not the last either. Yet to pity my lot will help not at all. From the captive Nilfgaardians, Meave learned Caldwell was a Tuzla castle in Angren's very heart. A small detachment would remain at Red Lobinden, while the Queen, with the rest of her force, set off to face the treacherous Count. Mom, I must speak to you when you find a free moment. I'll keep a close eye on him, ma'am. Don't you fret. I'm pleased to see you again, ma'am. You need something. You wish to speak with me? In private? Yes, ma'am. I've given thought to certain matters. The time's come to explain and reveal my decisions. I've not been entirely honest. But I've seen you very much deserve the truth. You're brave, wise, and above all, you've a good heart. And thus you're unlike any other ruler I've ever met, had dealings with. Isabel, what is it you wish to say? You're starting to worry me. I told you of Sintra and Sodden. Do you recall? It's true, I took part in that war. Yet I fought for the Empire. What? I'm not certain I understand. My name is Ispel Ep Muirmos, of Nilfgaard. I wish I could say I am from a conquered province. I wish I had that luxury. But no, I hail from the city of the Golden Towers itself. My, I'd certainly not expected that. Please, tell me more. I went straight from the academy to the army as majors do in Nilfgaard. Yet I truly believed our aim to be to build a better world. With our help, the majors, the Emperor conquered realm after realm, right up to the Amal Mountains. Yet he was not sated and turned his greedy eyes to the north. But the north stood and faced him. I'll never forget the bloodbath he wrought in Sintra. It was Unspeakable. He sought to intimidate us. He united us instead. Indeed. At Sodden, when chaos engulfed the Imperial Army, I saw my chance to flee the madness and begin life anew. 
And I did just that. I never sought thereafter to rejoin my countrymen or return to my home. Instead, I stayed in the north and swore never again to use my magic to harm others. Yet I cannot stand idle as the Emperor perpetrates atrocity after atrocity. I wish to fight at your side. All deserve a second chance. Yet from now on, there are to be no more secrets between us. Certainly. I thank you. You've no idea what this means to me. Good. Oh, and Isbel, this must stay between us alone. For your own sake. I appreciate the concern, ma'am. But you needn't worry about me. I've lived for some time in the North. And dare say I know how to get by. The City of the Golden Towers. Don't think I know any soul who's seen it with their own eyes. Did you know many common folk believe they're made of real gold, the towers? Yet they're named for how the southern sun dances off their rooftops. My family lived in the capital long before Nilfgaard was ever an empire. The city is of great beauty, was always a source of pride, turned arrogance in time. When I was but a lass, my father would take me to the grand amphitheater to watch the gladiators fight. A daughter of Nilfgaard should grow accustomed to the sight of blood, he said. For to conquer the world was our destiny. Dreadful. You must have hated it. At the time, I saw nothing wrong in it. I admired the gladiators for their bravery, skill, finesse. Though now it shames me to admit it. Duty calls. I must go. Of course. Should you need me, I'll be here. Your Grace, I wished once more to express my gratitude for your show of mercy. I showed mercy, true, but felt much more. Anger, pain, now resentment. You hurt me, Reynard. Wounded me to the bloody core. I don't know what else to say on the matter, so let's not speak of it. As you wish, Your Grace. Reynard, you fought in the first war against Nilfgaard, did you not? Yes, Your Grace. Though, as a mere captain then. Were they equally cruel? Did they scorch fields, turn peasants into slaves? No, Your Grace. They fought with honor in those days. So, what's happened? Why the change? It's said Emperor Emir Va Emrys's heart hardened over the years. He's grown crueler, more ruthless. His soldiers' zeal for violence has followed suit. But you don't say that. No, Your Grace. To your mind, why do they now despise us as they war against us? It is ever easier to loathe those you know. Before the first war, they knew nothing about us. Then they saw they had the better weapons, larger cities, superior craft. But in our towns, waste flowed through the streets in open gutters, and they concluded we weren't their equals. It's far easier to kill when one holds such a belief. It's time I attended to other matters. Maeve, I must say it again, I'm sorry. And I thank you for forgiving me. No need to say any more, Gascon. But you've got to know. Every time you bring it up, I'm tempted to change my mind. Now let's turn to the task at hand. Ever have regrets? Feel remorse? For what? Oh, I don't know. Killing innocents, perhaps? Murdering travellers, pilgrims? I've always warned them. Won't touch a hair on your heads, provided you don't resist. So, see? Gave them a choice. Besides, innocence? Please, Meave. We both know those to be mythical creatures. Everyone's got something on their conscience. So there's always call for murder? That's right. Dead right. You need but answer it. It's time I attended to other matters. Farewell. Yes, my lady? I haven't had the opportunity to thank you. Had you not been so alert, we'd have fallen to our deaths in Mahakam. I merely did my duty, Your Majesty. <laughs> Modest as ever. Yet once the war is over, I shall make certain you're properly rewarded. My lady, the one reward I desire is victory. Your victory. 
Other matters await my attention. We shall speak later. As you wish, my lady. No two ways to it. Charming this county the Blacklads granted Coldwell to rape. Yes. The gift so lovely Coldwell could not refuse. Ep Dahi, it seems, wished to be rid of the Count, so as to rule Lyria alone. I do wonder why they quarrelled. Caldwell wished to rule by Willem's hand, and by his claim. Of little benefit to Nilfgaard, so the General disapproved. As do I. By all means. Again and again and again. This could hurt. Watch your heads. <laughs> You're yapping and start digging. <sighs> My spirit's willing and how, but these damn boots are killing me. A reap, a time to sow, and a time to die. Get it to work.
again and again and again. Oh! Elven Blarney. This eyes will be reaping black clad heads. Army's a waste of time for one like me. What do you want of me? <laughs> I'm a monster. I smell a leak. My spirit's willing and how, but these damn boots are killing me. A reap, a time to sow, and a time to die. Fear not, we shall achieve our goal. Sky your tail, attack! Gonna need a um, three bucket of nails and a couple of pegs. Don't you worry yourself, Big Red. We'll get done in no time.
One bullet's all I need. Give me a time. Abolista, your command. I'm a monster. Again and again and again. Yeah, yeah, Peter. Start digging. My spirit's willing and how, but these damn boots are killing me. Shame to let this beauty go to waste. Give me a time. This could hurt. A reap, a time to sow, and a time to die. <laughs> Wait, you're serious? Serves a purpose. We must trust each other. The Lyrians came to a crossroads, 
As Meeve and her scouts conferred about the proper path to take, a footman, of a sudden, collapsed upon the muddy ground. His comrades strove to rouse him. Alas, to no avail. Meeve called for a medic. One arrived, post-haste. He checked for wounds, a heartbeat, all else for which a medic checks. Then he peered down the soldier's throat. In a flash, he was on his feet, his hand over his mouth, backing away. What's with him? What's wrong? The Queen asked, her eyes darting between the medic and his patient. Typhus exanthematicus, your grace, replied the physician, wiping his hands with a spirit-soaked cloth. Typhus fever. Contagious? Extremely, I fear. Though not yet at this stage. The spots are but in his mouth for now. Tomorrow he'll be blotched all over. It's then the disease turns infectious. I see. What about a cure? Is one known? The medic looked at Meeve, shook his head and shrugged. Alas, there was precisely naught he could do. But where medicine fails, magic may at times stand in. Without giving it two thoughts, Meeve called for Isbel. It's Typhus, I've no doubt. The healer confirmed. I know a spell that could be helpful. Vigil's cleansing, we call it. It takes time to prepare and many ingredients. Rather costly, or... Coins no object, said Meeve. Get to work at once. Isbel returned from the local herbalist with herbs valuable and rare. Fern blossoms, mandrake root, comfrey seeds and more. She then pulled from her bundle a variety of vessels, funnels, retorts, alembics, carafes. Coloured concoctions she then brewed, steam and strange odours rising from them. Hours later, after much effort, she had a few drops of a thick substance in a flask. Isbel whispered an incantation, then gave the remedy to the dying man. His tremors and fever subsided at once, the other symptoms fading within hours. At last, Meeve could breathe a deep sigh of relief. Tis a land of monsters. Belongs to them, it does. Abolist at your command. The morrow shall bring a better day. Ever have a storm knock out one of your teeth? I'm a monster. The white of an eye from half a league away. One bolt.
For no visible reason, the Lyrian column came to a halt. Neve stood in her stirrups in a bid to see the cause. Something had blocked the way, it seemed. Something large. A tree felled by a storm, or an abandoned wagon, the Queen thought. Neither was true. A boulder huge as a barn lay in their path. Footmen had slung ropes around it, planted their feet, and now sought to pull it aside. Could not budge an inch. Perhaps I could assist you. Meave turned in her saddle on hearing the voice. Several travellers in faded robes warily crept from the trees. A young woman with long, light-coloured hair led the way. You don't much resemble a rock troll, said the Queen, eyeing the slender stranger sceptically. But go on, do try. A fair-haired lass crouched beside the stone, closed her eyes, and began to whisper. Horses wheeled and tugged at their reins. A hound howled in the distance. And then, the boulder rolled to the side like an apple crossed the deck of a boat rocked by seas. Who are you? Do tell. A druid. Came her calm response. This stone. It stood in our circle. The woman silently turned toward the wood. Me followed her gaze, and among the trees saw other large stones, cracked and scorched. What happened here? We refused the Nilfgaardians' aid. Answered the druid. So they raised our shrines, though perhaps it's a blessing. A blessing? How so? A darkness fell upon Angren a time past, and it grows. The forest turns savage, its creatures drunk on blood. Folk have come to worship other cruel gods. It's time we abandoned this land forsaken and went south to Kedmerkvid. Our path leads south too. Though not as far, said the Queen. Do join us. Given the times, there's safety in numbers. The druids agreed and were grateful. They walked at the rear of the column, muttering prayers, their faces concealed beneath hoods. Angren lies thousands of leagues from the sea. Yet the Imperial fleet looked chiefly to this land for wood, its ashes and oaks ideal for shipbuilding. The lumber was driven down the Yoruga to shipyards in Sintra and Atra. There, day and night, Nilfgaard's fleet grew and grew. So when Meave heard axes steadily hacking, the continual grind of saws, she halted her force and quickly dispatched scouts. Indeed, they found a lumber camp, banners overhead, the great sun blazing upon them. Though not critical to her mission, Meave was nonetheless tempted to disrupt the invader however she could. The Emperor awaits a mass flow of logs, called the Queen, drawing her sword. But we shall send him corpses! Formation! Follow me! When the Lyrians rushed forth with a cry on their lips, the lumberjacks dropped their axes. Their black-clad guards, though likewise surprised, formed up and stood ready for battle. Again and again. 
again and again. Hold it! I don't like this. One bullet. Coin never stinks, no matter how rank the pouch. To work! Listen to me, old lady. This eyes will be reaping black clad heads. Nilfgaard's ranks folded. Soldiers fled in fright, stumbling over felled trees and corpses. The air was heavy with the scent of resin and blood. As she caught her breath, the queen looked about. Hundreds of trees lay cut down in rows. Oak and ash enough to keep the shipyards working till winter. Neve ordered the lumber requisitioned. Yet one of the loggers approached her. A man with a face like old leather, sawdust in his hair. Good lady. I know you wore hard against Nilfgaard. I know you'd keep timber out of their hands, but then see, we won't get paid. We'll see no coin till Sintra's shipyard see lumber. It's what the black lads said. I beg you, have mercy. We're simple folk. Been slaving since spring, got families to feed. And hunger looms ever close in wartime. Meave looked at the logger's hands. Thick scars, crisscrossed fingers twisted by years of axe work. This wood I cannot allow to reach Nilfgaardian shipyards, she said. Yet neither can I let you go hungry. I shall take the wood and pay you from my own purse. You 
you've got. You've a big heart, my lady. Not many folk like you, especially not in Angren. <laughs> on me hands from all this work. Weren't enough for cones on me feet, ye gods. Again and again and again. There's a time to reap, a time to sow, and a time to die. Nothing personal, I assure you. Give me a target. Watch your heads! <laughs> This is on! Shall achieve our goal. Ah, should have listened to me, old lady.
curse of traitors. I'm a one say. Army's a waste of time for one like me. Nothing personal, I assure you. I smell a leak. The chase is on! Skyatel! Attack! <laughs> if anyone asks, you've not seen me. Stop your yapping and start digging. Never had your kneecaps broken. <laughs> Gonna need um, three buckets of nails and a tub full of pegs. Don't you worry yourself in grace. We'll get it done in your time. You mad? Don't shake that! Brach! Scheiß! Gim! Tight! This 
discipline. That's what you folk lack. Left, right, left, right. Very far. Never had your kneecaps broken. <laughs> My pain serves a purpose. Every ribs a thief. There's been a mistake. I'm no mage. Uh, One bolt is all I need. Oh, my boots got sand up plenty in them. I bit the white of an eye from our bullies away. Yeah. Off to the front yet again. It's gonna be a right good levy, big and beautiful. Brach, shice, in tight. Stop your yapping and start digging. Self guard! In the tree. Entering the swamp's easy. In the distance, Meave spotted a spindle-like shape which soon proved an enormous, dark obelisk. It stood in the middle of a wetland clearing. Dozens of iron rings dangled from its shaft, clinking and rattling in gusts of wind. Cows, donkeys and dogs were gathered round the stone, all tied to the rings by ropes. Their hides showed many shallow cuts, seeping blood, festering, drawing mosquitoes in swarms. A number of the animals struggled against their cords, while others, near dead, lay still in the wet, tall grass. Across the clearing, folk emerged from the woods, a handful of peasants with a mule in tow. The beast resisted, stomped and planted its hooves, perhaps sensing its gruesome fate. The queen decided to question the peasants, and soon learned the animals were their sacrifice to the swamp gods. They're all about, dearie, very close. Oh, very, very close. The toothless old woman whispered. They hide neath murky waters. Can't feed when they hear the drip, drip of blood. 
The gods look kindly on those who make an offering. I know nothing of your gods, began the queen, her nose crinkled in disgust. But any that demand such grisly tribute are not at all worthy of reverence. What you do to these creatures is savagery. Savagery I can't allow. Run us off, you can, replied the old shrew. But soon as you're gone, we'll come back. As ever, we'll come back. This I know. So I must take care to leave you now to come back to. Over the peasants' howls and pleas, Meave ordered the obelisk brought down. Her soldiers gripped the ropes that hung from it and toppled the shaft. As it hit the ground, it shattered into many small pieces. You say you know naught of our guts? The old woman's eyes narrowed, her voice grew darker still. Well, don't you worry your head, sweetie. You'll meet him soon enough. They'll tangle your part. So a pox among you drive it to madness. Every last one. I curse you. All of you. In Gernacora's name. Undisturbed by the Haridan's screamed threats, Meave rode on. But her men whispered long of the curse. It weighed on their minds, poisoned their hearts. Each misstep, misfortune, they saw as punishment for their sacrilege. Made a swamp turn red with your blood! It's gonna be a right good levy, big and beautiful. Meave stood waiting while her scouts cut through the tangled branches and roots that had overgrown the trail through the swamp. Suddenly, a soldier doubled over and began to retch blood. The same symptoms soon afflicted others in her ranks. A potent poison, was the medic's verdict. It seemed all those who'd fallen ill had shared a tent. One night, they'd chatted about an obelisk they'd destroyed and the group of incensed peasants who'd cursed them for it. Fearing for their lives, the footman had gone to a local herbalist. She'd brewed them a potion to ward off black magic. Alas, the concoction had proved poisonous, while the herbalist had vanished without a trace. Happily, Isbel concocted an antidote in time to deliver the soldiers from a certain and agonizing death. The mage explained their misfortune had not issued from a dark, corrupt force, but from simple human wickedness. Her calming voice and gentle smile lifted the soldiers' spirits. Trusting in her care, they soon wholly forgot the so-called curse. Ugh! <laughs> 
Your Majesty? Are you well? <coughs> yes. <coughs> yes, but the stench. In Angren, all decomposes, be it dead or very much alive. Rot blights trees, seeping sores torment beasts, and the whole swamp emits the acrid, stifling stench of decay. So when, in the swamp's distant corner, the Lyrians caught whiffs of smoke and roasted meat, they stopped dead in their tracks. The scouts followed their noses to a clearing framed by a palisade, through the gaps in the posts, they spotted a small fort. Any banners upon it? Whose do you see? Asked the Queen. There aren't none, Your Grace. Not one golden sun, not one silver lily. Meave gave the gate a few solid knocks with her shield. Moments later, a dozen armed men appeared atop the rampart. The one who led them wore a beard. Who are you? Why are you here? I'm Meave. Queen of Lyria and Rivia. At war with Nilfgaard, I ventured into these swamps. <laughs> Is there a war on? <laughs> hey, that's news. Certainly, but little concern to me. The name's Gimpy Gerwin, and I rule these lands. Is that so? As conferred upon you by whom? By me. <laughs> Angren's a good bit larger than folk think. And no dukes or emperor's fingers stand to reach its every corner. Thus I just up and took this particular nook. Made it mine. So let's parley, Meave. One ruler to another. At the risk of being blunt, I don't care who wins this war. But I want to be in good standing with whoever does. So, I offer you a fire at which to warm your limbs. Also, a place at my table and beds for you to rest. On condition, you pledge to me one very small thing. To respect the sacred laws of hospitality. So be it. I do solemnly swear before the gods and my ancestors that we shall honor all the laws of hospitality. <laughs> then you're most welcome inside. The fort was simple, built of logs, covered with thatch. Oh, but inside, it 
was warm, dry. Hot, steaming dishes were piled upon platters, the tables beneath them bent from their weight. Smiles appeared on her soldiers' drained faces, and Meave's spirits were lifted at last. Gerwin proved a cordial host, and eagerly shared both food and tales. He'd led a mercenary band, and they'd stumbled into Angren, discovered a land unclaimed by any feudal lord. He directed the fort, then united the surrounding villages under his very own rule. The folk here are savage, defiant, he said, sipping wine. I keep them on a tight lead for their own good. Elsewise they'd slit your throat first chance they got. Late that night, Meave went to see if her mare had been dressed. In the stable, she happened on a farmhand. Recognizing the queen, the man fell to his knees and averted his eyes. Meave noticed a strange object dangling from a rope around his neck. A human hand half rotted to the bone. What? What is that? My wife's hand, your grace, stammered the peasant. Lord Gerwin caught a sneak in some grub. Scraps, really. Took her and told me to wear it so I'd remember what happens when... When... Meave left the stable without uttering another word. She went straight to the servants' barracks. In the pale glow of her torch, she looked over the peasants, all terrified, all with fresh, bleeding wounds. The queen felt rage rise inside her. The queen reached for her sword, but she'd taken an oath, so her hand paused on the hilt. Gerwin was cruel, deserved to be punished. But Meave would not do the deed. The queen blew her horn, woke her men from sweet slumber. She ordered them to assemble. They would march out at once. Gerwin rushed out, confused, to ask what had happened. Meave gave no answer, save to spit at his boots. Meave rode at the front, her eyes fixed on the ground, and thus spotted the pit masked by leaves and branches. She tugged hard on her reins and steered her mount to the side. Alas, the cavalryman behind her did not follow her lead. Leaves rustled, boughs snapped, and the horseman crashed to the pit's bottom, snapping his neck. Moments later, it was clear who'd set the trap when the forest came alive and a cry rang out. Life is mine now. It's gonna be a right good levy, big and beautiful. Yeah. Wise choice. <laughs> the chase is on. Is that why? To the Nidwar!
You must sweat like a swine in that jacket. Watch your heads! <laughs> El Hutter. An army's a waste of time for one like me. Alba! My spirit's willing and how but these damn boots are killing me. Catch! Retreat! Fall back! Caught between Lyrian Hammer and Skelligan Stone, Nilfgaard was shattered, destroyed. The victors now stood eyeing each other. These islanders were not like those Meave had met before. They wore no armor and carried no shields. At their fore stood a man as stout as an ox and bald as an ancient ghoul. His men called him Arnjolf, the Patricide. I thank you for your aid, Arnjolf, said Meave, extending a hand. Eid, she says. Eid, do you hear that, mates? <laughs> The Skelligers exchanged glances, then erupted in roaring laughter. Not here to help yous, not at all. We're after killing. Join me and you shall have your fill. Join yousins? <laughs> Just who the hell are you? Meave, Queen of Rivia and Lyria. Meave? Arnjolf said, his tone sobering. I know the name. Lippy Goodman called ye bold. Praise your courage to the high heaven. So be it. We'll follow ye into fire, wench. Just let us taste of blood. Grant us a death worthy of heroes. Meave couldn't help but smile, then nodded to accept. The Lyrians stepped aside as tattooed warriors joined their ranks. The scouts rode at the fore, with Meave right behind them. Their task, to find safe passage for the rest of the force. One among them probed for the quagmire's depth, a pole of five L's in hand. Suddenly, all heard a loud clang. The scouts dismounted, then heaved a bronze statue from the mire. Once it was cleaned of slime and muck, Meave instantly recognized its elven handiwork. The sculpture was exceedingly well preserved, save one detail. Someone had removed its face, leaving a black hole in its stead. Search the environs, ordered Meave. Amongst some brambles, they discovered the entrance to a vast tomb. Its doors had been torn open. On the ground before them lay scattered bones, some yellowed with age, others fresh, cracked and tattered from having been gnawed. Neve stood silent and contemplating at the tomb's threshold. Then, torch in hand, she entered and waded into fetid waters. Her soldiers followed close, arms at the ready, a nervous sweat on their brows. Frescoes on the tomb walls depicted Angren swamps and the beasts that prowled them. Two words were inscribed over the largest of the horrors, Gvern Iker. Suddenly, a roar thundered from deeper inside the tomb. Meave turned from the frescoes to see monstrous eyes blazing in the dark.
An army's a waste of time for one like me. <laughs> Ludifus, give me some of that. Discipline shall bring us victory. Coin never stinks, no matter how rank the pouch. No time. Pissing in the moat? Oh, you're dead. I smell a leak. In her torch's feeble glow, the queen examined the beast's corpse. She could not help but to shudder in disgust. Perhaps it's better, she thought, that we faced it in the dark. At the corridor's end, they found a closed door. Before any could draw near, it opened with a crash. Beyond lay a circular room. Light shone through a hole in the chamber's ceiling, illuminating a stone pedestal and the sword that lay upon it. The air in here. It crackles with magic, whispered Isbel. Meave gripped the blade's hilt. A soothing warmth filled her arms and spread across her shoulders. Her tired muscles ceased trembling. Her fingers, stiff as sticks, relaxed. She brandished her prize, the air hissing as the blade sliced through it. She then nodded approvingly. The reward had been worth the risk. Shame to let this beauty go to waste. 
One bolt I need. Give me a time. Abolista, your command. I'm a boxer. One bullet all I need. Give me a time. Ah! Abolista, your command. Beware! The bloody mistress despises those who kill her servants. Your Grace, the charts say we near Tuzli. Angren renders charts helpless to show the way, I fear. Soon we shall halt to sight our exact position. We will know then if our path is true. As you wish, Your Grace. and the horseman beside her exchanged a perplexed glance. They'd heard the song clearly, both its tune and its verse. Whoever had hollowed it had to be close, and given their diction rather well oiled. Moments later, a hamlet appeared to the Lyrian's tired eyes. A great bonfire blazed at its center. Around it danced peasants, barefoot, giggling, hooting, joyful and carefree. One by one, they noticed the queen. Soon, all were silent, huddled together, children peering from behind their backs. Fear not, said Meave. We mean you no harm. What do you celebrate? A lad's grooming? Nuptials? Nay, my lady. Hell yes. The gods have been kind. 
filled us nets and snares with game. Come time we thank them. Yes. You've things to be thankful for. We do, my lady. And we's poor folk. So a queen. Well, you must as well. Your Majesty, stay tonight, feast with us. There'll be music and plenty of room by the fire. <sighs> Why not? Began me, daintily dismounting. We all deserve some respite, I suppose. The Lyrians needed no convincing. With astonishing haste, they removed mail and helmets, then eagerly joined in the fating and dance. Amidst the trilling of flutes, fifes and fiddles, all those gathered reveled until dawn. They could rest at last, forget about Nilfgaard and the many beasts that prowled among the reeds. They'd long remember that night, the carefree laughter, peasant maids whirling in dance, the ale cold as a mountain spring, and the bread they crisped over the fire. One exchange in particular etched itself into the Queen's mind, an exchange she overheard. Not a little, not even a teeny tiny bit. I'll say it again, it's not your concern. Of course it's not. Wouldn't be so damn curious if it were. So be it. Keep your silence. But um, those eyes like the summer sky, that hair like waves of grain. I see the way you gape. What do you two speak of? Uh, your majesty. <laughs> Couldn't have answered that better myself. Who does Reynard gape at? Ah, the new ballista, what else? Ah, what a piece of work. Pure art, I say. Can't tear your eyes away for an instant. Ah, the ballista, you say? Precisely. Mmm. And what sets this machine apart from the rest? The smoothness of its wood? Its... Graceful curves and dainty angles? Majesty, if we may, I'd prefer not. I understand, Reynard. I know men often discuss the qualities of... Balliste. <laughs> Consider me gone. Me turned and walked back to the fire, sat down on an old stump. Ha! That was close. I... Shh! And the faintest of smiles crossed her lips. Meave expected the villagers to request recompense for their welcome. Yet the peasants made not the slightest mention of coin, and the queen was much moved by their kindness. Once again, those with the least had proved the most willing to share. The Lyrians did not assemble come the morn. The force marched off in the afternoon, unshaven, unbathed, disheveled. Not normally one to overlook contempt for discipline, that day Meave understood even soldiers needed to let their guard down, at times. <laughs> Sensing a limp in her mount's gate, Meave ordered the column to halt. There was a thorn in her mare's hoof burrowing deeper with every step. The horse whinnied and pulled her leg away, but Meave knew how to calm her. She stroked the mare's cheek, whispered slow words in her ear. She then extracted the thorn without difficulty. I'm sorry to interrupt, said the druid from behind Meave's back. Yet this is where our paths diverge. We've a modest gift to thank you for the road shared, and for your aid at the obelisk to the marsh gods. Meave wished to respond, but the druids had turned toward the woods, their satchels slung over their shoulders. The queen waited till they were out of sight to open the bundle. Their gift was by no means modest. The trees no longer wish us here.
In Angren's swamps, one can easily lose one's way. Thick fog fills the air, paths end without warning, dense thickets obscure the distance. The sole way to determine one's position is to climb a tree and peer out over the canopy. This duty fell to Meave's scouts, while the force halted below. During one such delay, Meave caught the words she'd longed to hear. Majesty! Tuzla Castle! Its tower! I see it! To her soldier's astonishment, Meave cast off her gauntlets and started up the nearest trunk. She longed to see the castle for herself, but then she would know sweet vengeance was at hand. The climb proved tricky as the trunk was slippery and the branches, run through with rot, were frail. Yet Meave showed herself to be skillful and spry. As a child, she had loved to scale trees, much to her governess' dismay. Meave looked out to see a mighty stone tower outlined against the horizon. Legend holds Tuzla Castle was to have had three such bastions. Yet King Ragbard, the fort's benefactor, had forsaken the effort when yet another stone transport simply sank into Angren's boggy roads. It was a moment of respite for Meave, a moment of quiet joy. She breathed and tasted air free of the bog stench. She took in silence undisturbed by the hum of mosquito swarms. And she relished her prospects. The coming battle against Caldwell. The soldiers stood exhausted and filthy, many with raspy coughs, all sick of the meager gruel. But with the command to advance, a new strength sparked within them. Their step was lively, a fire burned in their eyes, each hoping to spill Caldwell's entrails, then dash them upon the fort walls. Yet as they drew near the stronghold, perched atop a stone aisle, their verve dwindled, enthusiasm waned. They had taken fortresses with thicker walls, taller towers, and manned by more men. Yet they'd never seen nor laid siege to a fort standing on land so ill-suited. To rush the bulwarks through waist-deep mud. Was this even possible? Prove I was no fool to keep you at my side, said Meave, turning to Gascon and Reynard. A slaughter I must avoid. How will I do it? Your Grace, began Reynard. Set our machines to sling boulders. At the west wall, it's weakest. Tis our best chance at a breach. Our men'll need cover, added Gascon. Reeds we must harvest and burn. Smoke will cloak us. Conceal us from the castle's defenders. Good, agreed the Queen. Now get to work. Amidst billowing blue smoke, Lyrian footmen rushed through the breach wrought by Reynard's catapults. Though she had yet to forgive her companions, Meave had to admit, They'd given her sound advice. I knew you'd come. Your lofty pride presages another dramatic fall. You mad? Don't shake that! <laughs> this could hurt! Not at all. Life is mine now. <laughs> Wise choice.
Fail! Thing about slings, they hide well. Her Majesty knows what she's doing. Ah, you should have listened to me, old lady. Ah, there's not a reason why. Discipline shall bring us victory. We must exploit the breach in their fortifications, Your Grace. God save the Queen! For the last! Yeah! No one touch him! The count is mine! Many of Meave's victories have been immortalized in poetry and song, but not the fall of Tuzla. Lyrians fought Lyrians. Brothers killed brothers in rain and mud midst a cursed swamp. Certainly nothing to inspire a bard. Near the battle's end, Meave stormed the great stone tower to which Caldwell had fled. The queen ascended the stairs, dealing blow after blow, blood cascading down in her wake. She reached the top floor to find the Count waiting, with no intention to defend himself. If it's mercy you expect, you'll be sorely disappointed. Mercy? I know you all too well for that, Meave. Ever vindictive and cruel. All this from a paragon of knightly virtues. You stabbed me in the back, Coldwell, and used Willem to do so. My son! Who agreed without a moment's hesitation? Forsaken by your own son. Your flesh and blood. What's that say about you? Oh, you tread on thin ice. Choose your next words carefully. Spare me your threats. You'll kill me all the same. Death can come in many ways, Count. Some quick, some slow. My, my. How you strut and vaunt. Terribly sure of yourself. Perhaps too sure. Your castle is mine. I've crushed your force. I dare say no, I'm not. Precisely my point. Don't you see? The Empire's not one army, it's dozens, hundreds. It's what I strove to knock into that thick dome of yours. Alas, you're too much a dullard. Soon as I'd learned you'd crossed into Angren, I sent for reinforcements. They'll be here soon. Three regiments, armed to their teeth. <laughs> And they'll find your corpse impaled upon a spike, while I'll be long gone. <laughs> By which path, I wonder? But one bridge leads to Tuzla. As it happens, I ordered it raised as you laid siege. The swamps around the castle are too deep to cross. Try to rebuild the bridge, the Imperial troops will arrive before you can finish. Your men, they'll slay as you watch, and then they'll wring your neck. I wouldn't be so pleased were I you. You won't live to see this outcome. I know that, but I take heart in the truth. Though the castle you've seized and will likely kill me, I've won. Outsmarted you, Meave. Twice now. And you know what? Twasn't even that hard. With those words, with his arrogance and contempt, Caldwell had gone too far. The Queen gripped his shoulders, pushed. Caldwell stumbled backwards, then tripped out the window. A blood-chilling shriek filled the courtyard, then broke off abruptly. Now fool me thrice. Try. Meave slapped the dust from her hands. The traitor had met a deserving end at last. Yet this was no time to revel in the Count's demise. 
If Caldwell had spoken the truth, the Queen and her army were in grave danger. Neve scouts quickly confirmed the traitor's claim. The bridge was indeed in flames, and Nilfgaardian regiments were advancing from the south. Now to confirm if there was truly no other route by which they could flee. The Queen ordered her men to ask the local peasants. One of their number, a stable hand who'd lived near Tuzla all his life, claimed a secret path led out the back of the stronghold. King Ragbard himself ordered it built. Adam dropped great stones into its swamp, one after another, like beads on a string. Bitter water covers them, so you can't see Nout at start. You can make him out if you go proper slow, though. Oh. What is it? The stones. They lead to Isgith. And there, my lady, lurks an evil worse nor any black-clad army. What? A beast of some sort? Some say beast, others god. Gernikora, they call her. And you'll yet see, my lady. Isgith shines red with your blood. A silly tale to frighten children, Meave thought at first. Then paused. For something about the man's voice made his every word believable. None too encouraging, yet preferable to certain death. Tell me, from Isgith, will we reach the banks of the Yoruga, near Red Lomondon, perchance? Aye, Your Majesty. You need but head north. And pray all along the way. Soon, Meave stood where the stable hand had said she should, at the edge of a vast marsh. Carefully, she dipped a foot into the broth and probed for solid ground. Sure enough, she found stone. One cautious step, then another. Meave slowly strode off towards Isgith. With the path to Isgith hidden from view, Meave proceeded like one blind, moving solely by touch. With each step, she could not know if she would find rock or plunge beneath the black water's surface. The Queen's soldiers followed single file, carefully mirroring her every move. The Lyrians, near the end of their strength, got lucky when a light breeze dispersed the fog to reveal dry land. The Queen let out a sigh of relief. Oh, at last. Meave kicked off her boots to empty them of water and mud, then promptly screamed. Oh! Her legs were in leeches, slimy, bloated leeches. Ignoring the pain and trickling blood, she frantically tore them from her legs, wishing to be rid of them. Having plucked the last parasite from her calf, Meave grabbed her boot to crush the bloodsucker beneath her heel. Yet it had already slithered off. She spotted it on the trunk of a birch where, like a very fast snail, it was climbing. What the devils? But Meave's words caught in her throat. Leeches and ticks in the dozens dangled from the tree's branches. Some were so gorged on blood that their skin was translucent and on the point of bursting. Meave had some difficulty muting the urge to wretch. The queen stepped back finding it hard to believe what hung before her eyes, confused as to what it all meant.
Stop your yapping and start digging. Pay's late. Again. Again and again and again. My spirit's willing and how the these damn boots are killing me. Watch your heads! <laughs> Easier they are to target. An army's a waste of time for one like me. Slings, they hide well. I'm a one second. Nothing personal, I assure you. I'm gonna need um, three buckets of nails and a tub full of pegs. I'd hoped we could solve this some other way. I bit the white of an eye from half a league away. Thank you. 
one man's battlefield is another man's ripe patch for harvest. I bit the white of an eye from half a league away. I only lose corpses, except sometimes they're quite fresh. Tiny battles, hungry like a wolf I am. Bigger they are, easier they are to target. You can try to win them all, but you won't. Think about slings, they hide well. Take any more. One goal to go.
Abolist at your command. Armor won't save him. Lyria! One bolt's all I need. Lyrians marched in silence, too tired to keep in step with the drums. Suddenly, the wind rose to a howl, and there was a loud crash of thunder. Blast! Meave leapt from her saddle. We camp here. Pitch the tents, quickly! Quickly! As the soldiers rushed to unload the wagons, a wall of water came down, soaking them to the bone. Later, they sat in their leaky tents, huddled, teeth chattering violent coughs rocking their frames. The storm raged the night through, then finally passed before dawn. Meave emerged from her tent to wring out her coat. Raynard approached, his gait heavy, his face grim. Your Majesty, several men of the 11th, a dozen or so, sought to flee last night. Sentries stopped and bound them. Now they await your judgment. Meave fastened her still wet coat. She knew well why the men had tried to desert. They longed for their kin, had lost sight of victory, perhaps even no longer believed. Yet the marching and fighting seemed destined to go on forever. The Queen sympathized. She too was spent, and many doubts plagued her. Yet she knew the deserters had to be punished. The question was, to what extent? Meave entered the tent where the prisoners stood. Some of the men looked away, ashamed at their deed. Others raised their gazes to meet hers, their eyes red, tearful, pleading. You all know the penalty for desertion, Meave said to the soldiers bound at wrist and foot. I ought to have every last one of you hanged. Yet... We've come far along a treacherous road. Endured hardships extreme. This I considered against your crime. You shall lose rank and receive no pay for one year. Now get out of my sight. Immediately! The deserters mumbled their gratitude and rushed out of the tent, fearing the Queen might yet change her mind. Meave then left for her quarters, anger and bitterness eating her up from the inside. Gods, have we passed the very threshold into hell? Close ranks. None is to step off the path without clear orders to do so.
I'm coming, I'm coming. Curse traders. Arm is a waste of time for one like me. Nothing personal, I assure you. My spirit's willing and how but these dumb things are killing me. Her Majesty knows what she's doing. Watch your heads! <laughs> Want to know why I got my scar? One bullet is all I need. There's a time to reap, a time to sow. Gonna need um, three bucks of nails and a tub full of pens. One bullet's all I need. There's a time to reap, a time to sow, and a time to die.
harm is a waste of time for one like me. Nothing personal, I assure you. Every rib's a thief. Left, right, left, right. Give me a time. Tell me you jest. Again and again and again. Ah! Pissing in the mort? Oh, he's dead. It's gonna be a right good levy, big and beautiful. We must trust each other. Death is only the beginning! That is the white of an eye from half a league away. While accustomed to life mid swamp monsters and black magic, Angren's denizens never dared enter Isgith. The Lyrians only once saw signs of a human presence there when they spotted a group of thatched roof huts amongst alders. That settlement, is it inhabited? Meave asked, turning to her scouts. Impossible to say from this distance, Your Grace. The Lyrians entered the village, swords in hand, prepared to fight. 
but not a soul nor a beast came forth. Some homes had collapsed from rot, while tall grass concealed the paths between them. Yet, someone had been there not long past, for fresh ghoul cadavers lay by the well. Meave knelt beside the corpse of one cut clear in half. The beast's killer had been exceptionally strong, and wielded a razor-sharp sword. More likely to come around. Meave leapt to her feet. A man in thick leather armor had emerged from one of the huts. Transfixed by his cat eyes, the queen nonetheless sensed he was rather badly hurt. Were that true, my scouts would have blown their horns. The man pulled out a pendant shaped like a bear's head. It hummed and twitched as if striving to free itself of its chain. Far as monsters go, he said, lips curling into an unpleasant smile. Witchers aren't usually wrong. A moment later, a scream pierced the air. Quickly, instinctively, Meave drew her sword and lunged forth. They approach! Seems you were right. Again and again and again. What do you want of me? I smell a leak. I feel a strong magic here, my lady. Something controls these creatures. My pain serves a purpose. Blood washes away all shame! We'll catch them all! Oh, Lyrian lummoxes. Anger and suffering. For what? Ah, gotta listen to me, old lady. Here's late again. Arm is a waste of time for one like me. There we are! Back to the dust whence you came! This happens with weeping black clad heads. That'll be the last of them. Should be quiet for a bit. The Lyrians emerged victorious, due in no small part to the Witcher. Thanks for the help. Name's Ivo, Witcher, School of the Bear. Meave, Queen of Lyria and Rivia. Well, well. Didn't expect to see anyone out here. And certainly not a queen with an army in tow. We're not here by choice. I bet not. No one plans to pass through Isgith. And you? What's brought you here? A contract, perchance? That's right. Hunting a monster. I know your services to be rather dear. Who could afford a witcher's bounty in these wretched swamps? Nilf guardians. Blast, of course. Preparing the land for settlement. Call the monsters, drain the swamp, then bring in slaves. Doubtless from the north. Maybe. I got paid in advance. I didn't see the need to ask any questions. But did you have to take the coin? Don't you see what they're doing? Forgive me, your majesty, but seems to me you're confusing witchers with knights-errant. 
We don't fight oppression, right wrongs, or avenge orphans. We slay monsters for coin. And it don't matter whose head's on the front or whose coffers it's from. This beast you're out to slay, what is it? Hang on. You mean to tell me you've led your force into Isgith and don't even know what lives here? I believe I was clear. We're not here by choice. Yeah, but now that you are here, it'll take a minor miracle to get you out. Isgith's swamps? Realm of a truly dangerous being. Elves call it Gvern Iker, the Bloody Mistress. Over generations, locals twisted the name until it became Gurnikora. Indeed. I've heard it. So you've also probably seen her beloved fruit, leeches and ticks. You'd all be wise to stay away from them. This Gurnikora? What is she, exactly? Depends who you ask. Elves saw a fallen goddess in her. Never managed to cut her down while they lived here. But they did stem her growth, kept her from growing stronger. As for the local humans, spirit of a cursed princess, that's their take. Deep belief, actually. Care to elaborate? Stories that she was riding north to marry a Temerian duke. Whole retinue and caravan got lost, wagons got stuck, everybody drowned in the bog. Quicksand got him, that sort of thing. Gurnikora grabbed a root before the quagmire swallowed her whole. Hollered for hours, but there wasn't a soul around to hear her. Leeches, hundreds covered her, settled in for a royal feast, sucked her dry, drained her to pretty much the last drop. Fear and revulsion so completely overcame her spirit, she couldn't pass into the afterlife. So she came back, revived by Isgith's magic. Ugh, a chilling tale. Yeah, except made up, probably. Don't believe the elven legends, either. Gurnikor is a monster, plain and simple. Extremely dangerous, sure, but just a monster. The leeches and ticks. You called them her fruit. It's kind of complicated. We've time enough. Hmm. Gurnikor is a little like a vampire. They're kindred creatures. Except, instead of feasting on the blood of others, she feeds them her own. I'm not certain I understand. They're parasites, right? She puts them on her body, feeds them her own blood, then hangs them on shrubs and trees. Ugh, to what end? To other monsters, their delicacies. Sweet, juicy, full of Gurnikora's blood. Irresistible. Any beast that tastes that loses its mind, turns into Gurnikora's slave. So, if your paths cross and push comes to shove, she's not going to be alone. Find yourself fighting the whole damn swamp. How are we to fight her? How might she be killed? Sorry, sharing secrets. Just not something we do. Not even with those who saved your life just moments past. You gotta wait till she starts feeding the parasites. She's weakest then. Stand a chance to hurt her. Right. So we attack only once she puts the leeches to her skin. Yeah. And when you kill her, if you kill her, any beasts under her spell will weaken considerably. And then... You gotta burn her corpse. I mean it, understand? Burn it. And you? Will you not hunt her any longer? No, oh, I will. Just need to prepare. Realize that today. Gotta brew some potions, blade oils. Come back in a few days. I don't even have that much time. Nilfgaard's hordes pursue us. I must march on. In that case, wish you luck. Lots of it. I suppose there's no argument that would persuade you to ride with us. Your grace, mutations strip us of emotion, not reason. The Witcher vanished midst the trees. And Meave... Meave simply hoped her soldiers had not overheard any part of their conversation.
Caldwell had summoned Nilfgaardian support. Meave assumed they were not far behind. Yet in the unforgiving terrain, a full Nilfgaardian division could not hope to close the gap. Small detachments, however, light cavalry or footmen, could very well do just that. So when black-clad men emerged from the mist, the Queen was not surprised. She ordered her troops to fall in, form up, and brace to defend the line. Yet the attack never came. The invaders stood silent, motionless, and Meave got a closer look. They were slouched, ashen-faced, unsure of step, and covered in sores. Isgith had treated them as cruelly as any. Teetering in his saddle, the commander broke formation. He rode forth and addressed the queen in fluent common tongue. Half my men are wounded, the others sick. Your force does not fare much better. True. Yet we outnumber you soundly. Indeed. If it comes to combat, you are certain to win. But in this damp swamp, all wounds fester. Flesh is quick to rot. You will lose many more apart from those who fall. Hmm. What do you mean precisely? Asked the queen, her eyes narrowing, her head tilted to the side. We should part ways in peace. There's a war on, there'll be another chance to fight. Perhaps even face one another. But not here. And not like this. Suddenly unsure, the queen weighed the officers' words. Their logic was sound, though they could also prove a ruse. Your grace. Xavier's voice came from behind Meave's back. We can't let them pass. They've done only harm, and they'll not stop and go home. So be it. I accept. Meave answered after thinking a while. We shall cross swords some other day, beneath a clear sky, on solid ground. I will hold you to your word, Majesty, replied the Nilfgaardian, then raised his arm in salute. The retreating Imperials marched past the Lyrians. Along the slim path, their shoulders nearly touched. Meave soldiers glared from beneath their brows, their eyes locked on the foe till the last vanished in the woods. Then, collectively, they let out a sigh of relief. Every lives a thief. Late again. I'm coming, I'm coming. An army's a waste of time for one like me.
Never have a stone knock out one of your teeth. When will you ever learn? Ah, gotta listen to me, old lady. The Lyrian force had reached the very heart of his gift. From every branch, vine and shrub hung leeches and ticks by the dozen. Swollen with blood, their abdomens glistened, glowing red in the misty air. Air so putrid it set Meave's head to spinning. She paused at a moss-covered boulder, pressed her flushed forehead against its cool surface. Her soldiers passed by, pallid, filthy, drained. She wished to say something, lift their spirits. But instead a cough rattled her breast. Suddenly, splashes all around me in the water. As if a rain of fist-sized drops had begun to fall. The queen lifted her heavy gaze. Seemingly on command, ticks and leeches dropped into the warm, soupy waters, then clumsily wriggled off toward a dead alder grove. Meave knew at once what skulked behind the trees. Gernicora, Isgith's mistress, Isgith's queen. Weapons at the ready! The queen roared. Close ranks! The Lyrians quickly converged, formed a wall of shields and crouched behind them. Terrified, they stared as a multitude of eyes flashed open midst the branches while revolting, muck-covered beasts rose from the gurgling waters around. Meave silently uttered a prayer. Hail Melitaly, great mother, maiden and crone, ever have us in your care. Chase is on! One goal to my lead. How quickly the scales tip. Thing about slings, they hide well.
An army's a waste of time for one like me. These ghastly beasts can be slain. They can be overcome. What do you want of me? Her Majesty knows what she's doing. Left, right, left, right. Ice cars? No, they don't hurt. Of the battle in Isgith, Meave remembered very little. It seemed a nightmare, its details a haze, the sensations very real. Midst a thick fog, she fought in a frenzy, desperately hacking at the scourge that advanced from all sides. In the end, silence fell over the swamp. Its boiling waters lay calmed. The ticks and leeches were gone. While Gernicora lay among rotting leaves, covered in blood, unmoving. But still a fearsome sight. Burn the corpse, rasped the Queen. And we move on. The soldier's eyes darted about in a series of silent glances. It took Meave a moment to realize the difficulty. They still feared it. Though the monster's lifeless body lay on the ground, they dared not go near. Were she to repeat the order, they would carry it out. Yet she did not wish to force that on them. Swallowing her own revulsion, she walked up to Gernicora's corpse and set it alight. The air soon filled with the suffocating stench of burning hair and flesh. Sparks belched out as melting fat fell on flame. Until finally, nothing was left of the bloody mistress but scorched bone. The Lyrians resumed their march towards the banks of the Yaruga. They forced their weary legs to maintain a swift pace and stole no second glance at what they'd left behind. One day, the quartermaster approached with news to report. Alas, bad news. Your Grace, our food stocks have near run out. And about villages, folk have naught to spare, not even to trade. The Queen dispatched small groups of scouts. They were to scour the countryside for hunting camps, beekeepers, charcoal burners, any souls willing to trade food for coin or goods. The first scouts came back around dusk. The last three detachments returned not at all. At first, Meave suspected they'd fallen prey to monsters, the beastly or Nilfgaardian kind. Later, she learned the men had left naught of their belongings behind. She'd been soft-hearted toward deserters. This lot decided they, too, would give it a try. That night, Meave lay still but sleepless. Beneath thin covers, she was cold, hungry, irate. Towering alders grow thick in Isgith, their crowns weaving an expansive canopy that obscures the sky. Any sunbeams to slip through this twisted thicket scatter in the milky mist below. Thus the marsh abides in a state of perpetual twilight, wherein a sense of time and direction are easily lost. 
As the force moved along, a glow appeared in the trees. The Lyrians squinted, their mouths agape in wonder. An orb hung over the water, pulsating, humming. It circled the soldiers, darted off a distance, then hovered as if waiting. A will of the wisp, that is, whispered one of the footmen. I believe it's keen to show us something. Meave knew the wisp could prove treacherous, lead them into a trap. Nonetheless, she followed, though not entirely certain why. Her soldiers seemed eager, she sensed they approved. Yet she was also simply curious. We follow it. Carefully. Weapons at the ready. As the Wisp led the Lyrians down a narrow, winding path, Meave surveyed her surroundings warily. Beads of sweat emerged upon her brow, but her fears in the end proved unfounded, for at the path's end, the troops found what appeared to be a caravan's remains. Its wagons, rot-eaten, half buried in the bog, had sat there for decades, perhaps longer. Despite this, gilded panels and scraps of silver-threaded fabric showed they'd once been rather ornate. Inside the wagons, the soldiers discovered many steel crates. Rust-covered but intact, they contained truly dazzling treasures. Sacks bulging with gold coin, pearl-encrusted goblets, exotic velvets and silks in beads. Blimey, the sheer amount. In here of all places. A footman muttered under his breath. Meave quickly pieced it all together. She too had once ridden in such a caravan, splendid and laden with gold, when she'd left her home to marry. The rest of the story was not difficult to divine. This was a maiden's dowry. She and her retinue lost their way. Isgith proved their grave, unbeknownst to any other. The wisp circled Meave's party, blinked several times, then faded into thin air. The troops resumed their march, and all seemed in order. Seemed, for soon several footmen were discovered to be gone. Greed had been their ruin. They'd grabbed too much. The loot had weighed them down, and the marsh had embraced them. Here's late. Again. This could hurt. Again and again and again. Don't you worry yourself, Grace. We'll get a done in no time. Aye.
Watch your heads! <laughs> Discipline shall bring us victory! For Lydia! Hey. Never have a storm knock out one of your teeth. Have it the white of an eye from half a league away. Make love, not war. In evading Nilfgaard's banners, Meave led her force into Angren's wildest reaches. The foe could not attack the Lyrians there, 
yet hazards of another sort befell them. One day they reached a quagmire too vast and deep to ford. So the queen summoned her engineer, Xavier, and called on him to build a makeshift bridge. By nightfall, he had drawn up plans. We shall start by laying abutments, then drive piles into the mire. Hmm. The depth? We dropped plumb lines. Four L's. Consumed by the plans, Meave did not see as Xavier slipped a line off his shoulder. By the time she felt it on her throat, she feared it might be too late. I long awaited this moment, when we would be alone. <gasps> you die now, Majesty, and with you dies Lyrias, Rivias, the whole North will to resist. Hail, Ketzer, hail! What died was the Nilfgaardian rallying cry in Xavier's throat. At the last instant, Gascon and Reynard rushed in to save the warrior queen and thus proved their loyalty beyond any doubt. Your Grace! Your Grace! There was no answer, but Reynard could hear her breathe. Meave would live. It was several hours later when Meave finally came to. She opened her eyes, then Gascon and Reynard helped her to her feet. Careful, Your Majesty. I should have been more careful earlier. Damn it. If you two hadn't... No need for words. You needn't mention it. I couldn't disagree more. We're due for a long conversation. First of all, I owe you thanks. Second, my trust in you both has been heavily tarnished. I believe that goes without saying. Yet today you proved beyond all doubt that I can rely on you. So I thank you. To serve under your banner, Majesty, it is an honor. Likely I'd have put it differently, but Reynard seems to have the right idea. Very well. We've reassured ourselves of admiration for one another enough. We've matters to which we must attend. I trust as I lay there dead to the world, you did not sit about with your thumbs up your bums. Have you at least learned why Xavier betrayed us, sided with the Empire? In a manner of speaking, yes. Your Grace. The rogue who lunged at you, in truth, was one Gwalt et Winoch, a Nilfgaardian spy. This discovery you made how? We found in his toolbox a concealed compartment, letters inside. Though encrypted, we managed to decipher them. They were the Grey Rider, for you to read. The swine. An Imperial spy in my ranks this whole time. But to wait so long to strike, why? He'd only just received the order. Another letter in the box signed by General Eb Dahi stated, To Gwalter Eb Luinoch, eliminate M at first opportunity. Honourless bastards. They'll stop at Nout. Now, Meave, you'll gain Nout by getting riled. No sense to it. This is good news, in fact. Is that so? Think. Ep Dahi had a spy in our midst. He knew our movements, had his eye on us, his finger on the pulse. He knew our plans, who we parlayed with, and yet he didn't order your assassination. For you posed no threat. Well, clearly so much changed. Congratulations. Nilfgaard fears you now. And rightly so. Just a moment, that makes no sense. He saved my life in Mahakam, on the bridge. He did, for he had to. In one of the letters we found, Ep Dahi orders Gwalter to watch over Elder-in-Chief Hoog. The Scoia'tael in the mountains was sent there by Nilfgaard to recruit dwarves, but their commander, the Vixen, they feared she'd attack Bruva himself, something Ep Dahi wished to avoid. Naturally, for someone else could seize power, someone not so neutrally inclined, someone more likely to aid me, gods forbid. But we found him in the rubble at Rosberg, midst the ashes. Precisely what placed him beyond suspicion. We suspect Walter enlisted with the Adanians some years past, infiltrated that army. He had a hand in Rosberg's defense. Then when the time was right, he lent that same hand to its demise. Caused an explosion that tore a hole through its walls. It worked, 
but at a price. He suffered severe burns. If not for our medics, he'd have... Stop. So it was not elves who brought about the fort's fall as he claimed. A filthy lie to stoke the fires of racial hatred. To stir conflict and chaos and rage that would make the realm of Edurn waver and fall. If we're to judge by Rayla's actions, he was rather successful. Bastard. Yet even so badly hurt in such pain, not for a moment did he drop his mama's act. I've heard much of Nilfgaardian spies, Your Grace. They're trained from childhood, face constant indoctrination. They do anything for the Emperor, anything and everything. As soon as Gwalter spotted a chance to join our ranks, to be at your side, he took it, exploited it ably. We've talked enough. We must form up. Move on. Majesty, you ought to rest. You stand swaying. Your step can't be too sure. Only my horse needs step true. Maeve, you've just about had the life chopped out of you. No time to play the hero. I'm not, Gascon. Quite the opposite, actually. These damn swamps, they terrify me. I wish to get the hell out and never, ever look back. The Aruga lies near. I sent scouts ahead. They've secured a barge. We can sail to Red Lobindon. Splendid. Sound the horns. We march. <laughs>